Welcome everybody to part 2 of Subway Surfers in Scratch. In this tutorial we are going to be programming the barriers for our player to jump over and to avoid so that we can start turning this into a game with some difficulty and we will also be adding a scoring system so that you can keep track of your progress over time and compete with your friends. Alright, let's start programming. Well, here we are where we left off in the last tutorial. We have the 3D rails and the 3D character and we can move left and right and jump up and down. Now it's time to get started on the barriers. So for that, we're going to paint a new sprite and call it barriers. You can make your own costume, use someone else's costume, use my costumes that I have in the project linked in the description, but I'm going to paint my own costume. What you have to make sure though when making your costume is that if you move the sprite to the center it kind of looks like it is within the size of the lines and also if possible make sure it is symmetrical. Oops, I almost forgot to mention that your sprite has to have the bottom sticking at the crosshair. So I'm going to center it and then move it up until the bottom is sitting right at the zero. This will come in important later. Now we are going to start programming it. The barriers and the trains later on are both going to use a clone system where we are going to create clones and they are going to randomly start at the top and move down to the bottom and then delete themselves. So for this we are going to use when the green flag is clicked. We want to hide the main sprite since the main sprite is just creating the clones. Now we want to be able to copy the clones so for now we are going to use a forever loop, a weight block, make it weight a random of 1.0 to 2.0 seconds and the reason why I'm putting the decimal point is so that it can choose any random number with a decimal as you can see here as opposed to just a whole number and then uh, create clone block later on we are going to change this up so that it will work with the trains and make a more advanced spawning system so that we can have certain patterns of trains and barriers to make the game more interesting but for now this will do. Now we're going to param the clones which is the main functionality of the barriers. We want to have a variable to store which lane the barrier is in, kind of like the player, so we're going to be creating a sprite called lane and set it for the sprite only since we want each clone to have its own copy of this variable. Then we're going to set that from minus 1 to 1. Now for the looks, we want to switch to our low barrier, since later on we are going to add some high barriers that you have to crouch under. Then we want to show, and then finally we want to go to the back layer. Now we are ready to have the barriers move. However, we want them to smoothly come in from the top, and smoothly exit through the bottom. And you may note that there is something called sprite fencing where Scratch does not let the sprites to go fully out of the screen as they will always stick out a bit at the top or at the bottom. And we do not want this. However, lucky for us, there's two tricks to get around this. One of them is that we can set the size to be really big, then go down low or high and then change the size again to have the sprite go off of the screen or without changing the size we can alternatively switch to a really large costume then change our position and then switch back to the smaller costume we're going to be using the second method as I think it is a bit more simple than changing the size so make sure to create a really large costume, I'll call this one huge, and it doesn't matter exactly how big as long as it is really big. Now we're going to be creating a costume block to set our position using this technique. Call it go to, add two inputs for the x and the y position we want to go to, and then select run without screen refresh so that everything inside of this custom block happens instantly. Now we are going to be defining it, 
first of all, in the variables, we want to create a variable to remember which costume we were at before. Let's call it costume and set it for the sprite only. Now we want to set the costume to the costume name. Next, we want to switch the costume to huge. Then go to the position we want to go to. And finally, switch back to the costume that we were at before. Now, if we test it out, we can drag one of these blocks over here and go to minus 500. And before we test it, we have to switch our costume back to low. And now if we run it, you will see that we are setting our Y value not all the way to minus 500, but to something that is already off of the screen. And that is all that we really need. Now back to the movement. We are going to use the go to block to initially set the position of the barrier to be at the very top of the screen. We're going to be setting the X to the middle of the lane which is going to be lane times 70. We can adjust this later, but for now I think this is a good number. And then for Y, we're going to be using 180. Since we set the bottom of the sprite to be right at the middle, this will mean that 180 is just barely not visible at the top. You can see actually it is still a bit visible, so I'm going to move the sprite just a tiny bit higher. Perfect. Now we're going to need a repeat until block so that we will continue moving down the screen until we reach the bottom. So grab that block and for the condition we are going to be checking if our y value is less than the y value at which our barrier just barely does not become visible anymore. And we can do this by checking the total height of our sprite. So right there, that second number, as you can see, is 68, which means that we have to go to y minus 180 minus 68. So I'm just going to use an operator here so that if we change the height of our sprite, we can easily change it over here. So it's going to be minus 180 minus the height, 68. At which this point, we're going to delete our clone. Now for the downward movement of our barriers, we're going to be using our block along with some basic algebra to calculate the x position that we need as it is going down the screen so that it will stay in between the track that it is on. We're also going to be changing the size depending on the y position so that it will create a more convincing 3D effect. So to start with the maths, we're going to be using an addition then two multiplications and for the very right of our addition we're going to be using once again our lane time 70 and now starting from the left we're going to use y position our lane variable and then a constant now for our y position we need a negative a plus and another multiplication. For the left two, we need our y position again. And now the next two numbers are also going to be constants. Now it is very difficult to adjust these constants manually, bit by bit. So we will be using, so we will be using a more methodic approach that will help us get to the answers faster. I'm going to drag this go to block out of here and we're going to be using a set block so we can set the lane manually. I'm going to set it to, first of all, I'm going to stop the project and I'm going to set it to minus one. Click on it to run it and just view that so we can see it for now. And I'm going to set the Y position to zero. Perfect. Now we must adjust these values so that when we run this block, it goes in the middle of the lane. So essentially what we are doing here by adjusting this value is that we are adjusting how far left or right the barrier has to go so that when we reach y equals zero here in the center, 
the barrier is right in between the two lanes. And actually, we are already pretty close. I'm going to try a higher value, 75, run it. And that is very close, however, I think just a bit more. Let's try 78, run it again. And that looks to be perfectly in the middle. Now we have to adjust the slope. This value adjusts the slope of the angle. So if we adjust it, we want it so that when you move the sprite at the very top, it is in the center. And when we move the sprite at the very bottom, it is still in the center. So I'm going to set the Y value to something lower or higher. I'm going to use minus 100. And you will see it is off again. So we will be adjusting our slope constant, which is this number over here. And I'm going to try at first a very small negative number, such as minus 0.2. Make sure to run it. And that looks to actually be perfectly in the middle of the lane, which is very nice. We can test it at a few different values. So if I put in 100, press the go to block, it still seems to be in the middle. And it will follow also for the right. So if we set the lane to 1, and then test it, it works the same on the right, since we are multiplying the slope by the lane that we are on, flipping it whether we are on the left or on the right. Then the y position constants we will adjust later when we are animating it in real time. I'm going to return the block to its position and get rid of this rubbish block. And we can also hide again the lane variable. Let's put in some random constants. So for here, I'm going to test a very small number. And then in the addition, I'm going to use a number such as 10. All right, let's give it a go. So as first, you can see that it is moving very slowly and then speeding up very much as it goes further and further down. This constant over here determines how fast it speeds up as we are going further and further down. And then this constant determines how fast we are going by the time we are at y equals zero. I think this constant needs to be obviously a little bit lower so that the speed up and slow down is a bit less dramatic. The reason why we are making it slow down as it is higher and speed up as it is lower is because when objects are more far away, they appear to move slower than when they are close. So this helps create a better 3D effect. Now let's run it again. And this seems to be better, but still kind of strange. And the reason for that is that although it seems that the barriers are getting smaller, they are actually staying the same size the whole time. We have to manually make them smaller at the top and bigger at the bottom to give this effect more realistic. Let's stop the project, go to looks and drag in a set size block. And we're going to drag in this equation over here. The reason why we are leaving out the y position minus is that that makes it so that we are changing our y position depending on what it was before. So this calculates how much we should change our y position. And then this is relating it to our earlier y position so that, of course, we change it. However, we do not want to change the size for depending on our previous size. We just want to set the size as a function of y position. Now we can test it out and see that our sprites are extremely small. However, this is actually because this constant determines the size of the sprite when it is right in the middle. So we have to increase that all the way up to 100. Let's test it out again. And you will see it is starting to work a bit better. However, the change in size is way too minor to be noticeable. When you remove a zero from the decimal, so instead of 0 0.04, it is just 0 0.4 and test it again. Of course, this takes a lot of tuning until you get it into a place where you really like it. I'm going to decrease the change to 0.3 instead. And it still seems to be increasing in size too much. So maybe even a bit less. Maybe just a tiny bit less. And I think that that looks good. Now let's move on to checking if the player is colliding with the barrier. 
for this, an if statement, and then a condition that will be checking if the barrier is very near where the player is supposed to be standing, if they are both in the same lane, and if the player is on the ground or very close to the ground where the player will trip over the barrier. Let's start with checking if it is right near the player. Let's use an AND block and then two opposite operators. Checking if the Y position, if it is less than minus 95, but still greater than minus 105. So this will only be true if they are within 10 pixels of where the player is standing, which is minus 100. Let's drag in another AND block. This time checking if the lane that we are in is the same as the player lane. And now one more AND block. Checking if the Y position of the player. Oops, we still need an operator for that. There we go. Checking if the Y position of the player is less than minus 50. And of course, adjust this number and these numbers as needed. And the reason why we are not simply checking if the Y position is equal to 100 is because with these maths, it is very rare that the barrier will actually ever reach to a Y position that is uh, exactly 100. So we have to check a range and see if it is within that range. Let's drag it into the if then block. And temporarily, we are going to be using the stop all block. But later on, we can make it so that uh, you lose title pops up. Now let's test it out. Wait for a barrier and let's jump over. And that works. And if we run into it, you can see that the game stops. You can also let the barriers pass by on a different lane and we will not lose. Perfect. Now we are done for the barriers in this episode. However, we will likely be editing them and making them even better in later episodes. For now, before we finish it up, let's quickly add a scoring system so that you can see how many points you have got. In the variables, let's add a score variable for all sprites. Oh, there we go. There we have the score variable. And now I'm going to be using the stage for this logic. And it is very simple. When the green flag is clicked, we are going to be setting the score to zero. And then forever, we set the score as a function of time. So the score is depending on the time. Let's take the floor of the timer times 10. The reason why we are doing floor is that floor is rounding down always. And the, oops, I put 100, not 10. I keep putting 100, there, 10. The reason why we are using floor is because it rounds down. You can use round or even ceiling if you want the player to start with one point. However, I think that this makes more sense as you start with zero points. Now you can adjust this number to whatever you like. You can make it something crazy like 10,000 and have the player get a million points per second. Uh, but I like it so that it is just 10, which I think is a good combination of not too fast, but not too slow. And of course, we can double click on this to make it a large display and make this position wherever you want on the screen. Well, we are done with another episode. Today we have added in barriers to make our game challenging for the first time, as well as adding a score so we can already start keeping track of our scores. Episode 3 will be coming soon, where we will be adding trains to the game, which are similar to barriers but more complicated as they are very long and have to still have that 3D effect. But most of the base work for the game is already laid out. In the comments section, you guys, of course, I would like to hear what your requests are for future content, if you would like me to add coins, or if you would rather have power-ups, and I will be very happy to respond. Once again, you can join the Discord server asking for help or sharing your creations, even if they are not related to my YouTube channel, and have fun with other scratchers. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for future episodes, and have a good day. Bye-bye.